Hi and welcome to the Automated Testing with Python course. Software testing and automation are two growing fields and key use cases for Python. My name is Jose Salvatierra and I'm a test engineer turned software developer. When I was working with one of Scotland's leading software companies, I learned the value of engineering excellence and automated testing. Now I want to help you learn them as well. But who should learn automated testing? Software developers who want to continuously and effectively test their applications as they make code changes. This helps reduce bugs and improves productivity. And manual testers who want to take the next step in their careers. Automation saves a lot of testing time and makes regression tests far more reliable. With this course, you'll learn about all the major types of tests, including unit, integration, system, and acceptance. We'll cover mocking and patching. We will learn about testing web apps and REST APIs using both web scraping and Selenium, as well as key topics such as explicit and implicit weights. All of the Selenium code we teach in this course has been crafted through years of learning and working with large test code bases in large companies, so you learn modern, real-world skills, and that includes behavior-driven development. In addition, you will learn about using Postman to write system tests for a REST API. At the end of the course, we will learn about working with Git, as well as how to set up continuous integration pipelines that run our tests automatically whenever we make code changes. I'm really excited to guide you through this course. It is the culmination of a lot of professional experience, so I'm sure you'll love it. I'll see you on the inside. Hi guys, and welcome to this Python refresher. In this section, we're going to learn about all of the main features of Python that you might need for this course. As such, it is a bit of a long section, so there's a couple of things you can do in order to speed through it faster. This is what you'll see when you are in the course, and you can see on the right you've got all of your lectures. If you know the contents of any one lecture, for example, you already know about string formatting in Python, then you can skip that video entirely, and if you want to mark it as complete, you can do so by just clicking on this little box there. I do recommend that you speed through the videos. You have a look at a couple of points throughout the video to make sure that you do know everything that's covered. In addition, something else you can use to go through these videos faster is the speed playback rate in the Udemy player. If you think I'm speaking too slowly or you just want to go quickly through the videos, you can always click on it and change the speed setting. As long as you can understand me, you'll be okay. Thank you for joining me again in this course. I hope you'll enjoy it. I'll see you in the next video. Hi guys, and welcome to your first video in this Python refresher. In this video, let's talk about variables. A variable in Python is a name for a value. You can think of them as similar to those in algebra, but there are slight minor differences that you'll understand as you program more in Python. Here's how we define a variable. You can define the variable name, for example, x, and then you'll type a equal sign and finally, you'll type the value, for example, 15. And what Python is doing here, and this is very important, is it's creating this value that's after the equal sign first. So here, Python sees the value 15 and it says, okay, you're going to use the value 15. I will, you know, create that or store that somewhere. And then it's going to say, and what am I going to refer to that value as? And that's going to be x. So the right side of this assignment this equal sign happens first, and the left side happens later. I'll say at this point, there are a few values in Python where Python has already created them before it runs your code. So Python doesn't create these values when you use them, but if you have something like 1500, then Python will do what I just said. It will create this value and store it in its memory, and then X will become a name for this value you just created. As well as integers, which are whole numbers like we've got here, you can define variables such as 9.99. And here what I've done is I've created the value 9.99, which is a float value or a value with a floating point. And then I've told Python to give that value the name of price. Let's say we've got a variable called discount and it equals 0 0.2. We can then say that the final result of our price when the discount is applied would be the price multiplied by one minus the discount. And here's what happens when you execute this. Of course, following the rules of mathematics, which Python does, this gets evaluated first since it's between brackets and you get 0 
1 minus 0 0.2. Then you're going to multiply 9.99 by 0 0.8, and that value will get calculated and stored in Python's memory. Whatever that is, result will be the name for that value that we'll refer to from here on. If you wanted to print a value out and show it to the user, you can very easily do that with the print function. So here we will type print, and then inside brackets, we will type result. The brackets in here are not the same as they are up here. Here they are used for order of preference in mathematical expressions, and here they are used to signal to the print function what we want to print. And this is fairly common in Python. Whenever you see a name, such as print, followed by these brackets, what you've got is a function. And a function in Python is something that performs an action, such as showing something to the user, or it calculates an output based on some inputs. Uh, or it can do both. We're going to look more at functions in a coming video. But this is how you'd show the user something in the console. So at this point, I'm going to save this file, and I'm going to run it. And you can see that the output is 7.992. So this output here is what this line 8, this print function, will calculate. Notice that we've got a number of other variables up here, but we are not printing them out, so they will never be shown. As well as integers and floats, Python has another data type called the string. Integers and floats are used for mathematics or for calculating things, whereas strings are used to store characters. For example, a person's name, a person's date of birth, a person's phone number, so on. Even though some of them do contain numbers, they're not going to be used for mathematics, those values, so we can store them in a string instead. Let's say that we want the person's name to be stored. What we'll do is we will say name equal, and then inside quotation marks, we will type Rolf. What Python does is it creates this string first, and then this name here becomes a name for that string. Notice that you can reassign a name, so that we can do something like this if you'd like. And now, name, instead of being a name for Rolf, will be a name for Bob. So no two variables are created here, it's just the same variable, but we have essentially moved it. You can of course print this out if you want, and I will save this file and run it. And you'll see down here that we get Rolf printed out, because that is the contents of our string. Note that Python uses the quotation marks to signal a string, but these quotation marks themselves are not part of the contents. They are just used as delimiters. Instead of double quotation marks, you can use single quotation marks if you like, and that is totally fine, as long as you don't mix and match them. If you mix and match them, then that won't work, and Python will complain. I recommend you always stick to one same type of quotation marks, and I generally use double quotation marks. What happens if we print the name multiplied by 2, which is how you would multiply any number? When you run this, you'll see that the output is now Rolf, because that's line 3, and then you get Rolf Rolf for line 4. What's happened here is this has essentially done name plus name. It added two names together. That's the same meaning as the multiplication. And when you add two strings together, what Python does is it will join them, and it will add one after another, so you can end up with a longer string. This can be very useful at times, but normally is not what you want when you multiply a string by a number. Let's say you have two variables, a equals 25 and b equals a. I mentioned earlier that 25 is a special value because it is under 255, so Python creates it as soon as Python starts up. If it was a larger value, then at this point Python would create it. So we get the value 25, and we say that a is a name for that value. From here on, we can refer to a, and really we'll be referring to the value 25. So what happens when b equals a? Well, Python is going to evaluate a, and it's going to say, okay, a is a name for 25, so we're going to use 25 here instead. So this means the same thing as this. And then b is now a name for a, which really means that b is a name for 25. So now both a and b are names for the number 25. So you can verify that that's correct by printing them both out. So I'm going to print A and then print B, and you'll see that we get 25 and then 25, which is perfect. But what happens if we do B equal 17? Should A be 17 as well? 
Well, let's run that. And now down here, you get 25 and 25 for lines 4 and 5. And then you get 25 and 17 for lines 9 and 10. What we've done here in line 7, when we said b equals 17, is we've told Python to evaluate the value 17, and then make sure that b is a name for 17. Python completely disregards that b was a name for something else before. And it just says, okay, this b thing is a name for 17. a is completely unchanged. The assignment expression, when used like this, does not change other variables. It just changes the variable that you refer to. There are ways for us to change a by using b, but not when we're talking about integers. We will talk about that later on in the videos when we learn about mutability in the language. All right, that's it for this Python refresher on variables. Do remember that this is not a Python introduction course because we've talked about some quite advanced things here, but it's just to get you back up to speed with Python in case you have experience from before or with other programming languages. Thank you for joining me in this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi guys, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to learn about lists, tuples, and sets, three different collections in Python that allow us to store multiple values in a single variable so that we can use them all at once or maybe extract some of them individually. Let's get started. We're going to define one of each just so you know how they are defined. So L is going to be a list of three elements. And here I've created a variable called L for list and I've made it equal to a list. The list is defined by using square brackets and inside the square brackets you can put different values as long as they are separated by a comma. So what I've got here is one string, then I've got a comma, then I've got another string, then I've got another comma, and then I've got another string. So three strings separated by commas inside square brackets. This defines a list. If you didn't have lists or tuples or sets, you would have to define three variables, one for each friend. And that will make it difficult to interact with all the values at once. You'll understand what I mean as we progress through the video. A tuple is very similar to a list, but instead of using square brackets, you use normal brackets. The key difference between lists and tuples is that you can't modify a tuple. Whereas you can add and remove elements from a list, you can't add and remove elements from a tuple. That's the key difference between the two. Finally, a set is again very similar, but you use curly braces instead of square or normal brackets. And the key difference between a set and the other two is that while you can add and remove elements from a set, you can't have duplicate elements. So you couldn't have Bob twice in the set. Also, lists and tuples keep the order of the elements. So whenever you print out this list, it's always going to have Bob, then Rolf, and then Anne in that order. But sets don't necessarily keep the order, or rather the order is not guaranteed. So the order could change at any moment. Sets are useful in a few scenarios that we will learn about in the coming videos. You can access individual elements of a list or a tuple by using subscript notation. So for example, you can print L and then zero in square brackets. So what we've got here is our list variable. And then we've got square brackets, zero and close square brackets. This notation here is called subscript notation and you can apply it to many things in Python, but you can use it on lists and tuples. And what it does is it gives you that element, the element with index zero. Elements in programming usually start counting at zero. So the first element here, Bob, has an index of zero. Then this one has an index of one and this one has an index of two. So you could access an by doing L2. This also works for tuples, so you can use your tuple variable there instead, and that's totally fine as well. However, it doesn't make sense to do that in sets because they don't have any order. So if you access the third element of a set, you don't know what you're going to get. That's why sets don't allow you to use subscript notation on them. You can modify individual items in a list by accessing the item itself using subscript notation and then you're treating it like a variable. So for example, you can say L0 equals Smith. And then if you print your list and you run it, you'll see that the first element is now Smith, second one's Rolf and the third one's Anne. 
However, if you try to modify a tuples element and you run this file, you will actually get an error because tuples cannot be modified after they're created. So you can't use the equal sign on anything inside a tuple. Of course, you cannot do this on a set because a set does not allow for this subscript notation. You can add elements to a list by doing l.append. And what append does is it will add an element to the end of the list. So if we append, for example, Smith to this list and then we print it out, you'll see that this list will now have four elements. That's Bob, Rolf, Anne, and Smith. But again, because tuples do not allow modification, you can't change them, then if you do something like this, you're also going to get an error, and it's going to tell you that the tuple object has no attribute append. What that means is that we've tried to access something called append inside, that's what the full stop means. So we're trying to access append inside of our tuple, but our tuple doesn't have anything called append inside it. We're going to learn more about what I mean by inside in the next few videos. It is a little bit of a more complicated topic, but rest assured that you can't add things or remove things from a tuple. Talking about removal, you can remove things from a list by doing L dot remove and then passing in the element that you want to remove. For example, if you wanted to remove Bob, then this would do that. And then if you print L, then you'll see that Bob has been removed and you are only left with Rolf and Anne. Going back to adding, you can add things to a set. So you can do set add Smith, and then you can print your set. And here you can see that you get Anne, Bob, Smith, and Rolf. Notice that the order is not the same as when we created this, but all the elements are there. However, if you do the same thing twice, you'll see that Smith will only be here once. That's because even though we told the set to add Smith twice, there can be no duplicate elements inside a set, so the second Smith is actually ignored. This was a very brief primer or refresher uh, regarding what lists, tuples, and sets are. So just remember that lists are the most standard collection where you can add and remove elements as well as modify them. In a tuple, you have those elements and you can't modify them and you can't add or remove elements. And finally, a set has no duplicate elements and it also has no order. That's everything for this video. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you in the next one. Hi and welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at the post. In any blog, a post has two basic attributes, a title and some content. Now, depending on which platform you go to, a post can also have a lot more attributes. For example, it can have some metadata, it may even have a specific author, it may even have things like created dates, updated dates, it can have images uh, like a hero image and so on. For this app that is going to be a, a console based application, very simple, just to get you started testing Python apps, we're going to stick to its most basic representation. So our post is going to be a class that contains two properties, title and content. And a blog is going to contain multiple posts and the blog is going to have the author. And so each post is not going to have its own author, only title and content. Now, you're, you may already have some experience with Python. If not, this course may be slightly quick if you are a complete beginner, in which case I apologize in advance. But if you do have some experience with Python, it should be possible for you to create a post class that has two properties, uh, title and content. I'd recommend you pause the video and go ahead and create this class if you can. Hopefully you managed. And if you did, this is how I would go about creating the post class. I would do class post, and then I would define an init method. And the init method is the constructor. This is what gets called when you initialize a new object of class post. And in this init method, we're going to take in two arguments, title and content, and we're going to define two properties in our object, self.title and self.content. And that is um, what this class may look like. Now, we know that this is likely correct, 
but we want to write some tests for it. There are a couple of things that we have to think about before we start writing any test. And the first thing that you'll want to think about is, does the thing we want to test depend only on itself or does it have any external dependencies? Does it depend on any other files or any other systems like a database or a web API or anything like that? This is the first question you have to ask yourself, even for the simplest of things. And naturally here we can see that this depends on nothing. This is um, just a class that gets instantiated by something and then it, it ends up with two properties, title and content. This is a very simple uh, method and you may be tempted not to test it. But as you develop this blogging application and you add more things to a post, this method may get more complex. So it's good to start with a simple test that you can then expand as uh, your code grows. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the tests folder, the tests uh, package, and we're going to create a new Python package in there, and we're going to call it unit. And these are going to be our unit tests. And here is where that question on dependencies comes from. For any methods or functions or classes you want to test that don't depend on anything else, you're going to put them in the unit tests. Um, so whenever we create a test for something that doesn't depend on something else, that is a unit test. If we create a test for something that depends on something else, that is a different type of test. Okay, and we're going to look at those different types soon. Okay, so let's go ahead and create our post test class. In Python, particularly in the unit test framework that we're going to be looking at in this course, and the unit test framework comes with Python 3, each test suite is a class. Uh, in this case, it's called post test, and it always has to inherit from a particular other class, which is test case. And test case is part of the unit test uh, library. So we're going to do from unit test, import test case. Now that we have it, what we've created here is our first test case uh, or, or set of tests. Now we are going to test our post. So presumably we're also going to have to import that. So let's do it. So we've got our test case and our post. Let's begin by writing our first test. We're going to test if when we create a post object, the correct properties get set on it. Every test uh, that you create with unit test and indeed with most um, uh, testing libraries in Python is going to be a function. And that function has to start with the word test underscore. So we're going to do test underscore and then whatever we want to call our test. In this case, I'm going to call it test create post. Okay. And in here, if the test succeeds, meaning it, no errors are raised, then the test will pass. Otherwise, the test will fail. And um, the unit test library, when we run this test, will complain and will tell us that we've got a failure. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do, and I'm going to write some code, is we're going to create a new post. And this post is going to be a post object that has a title test and a content of test content. And then we're going to use the test case API, which remember is the self object because we've inherited from test case. I'm going to say assert equal that test is equal to p dot title. So what this is doing is it's saying test case, make sure that test, the string test and the post title that we've created here are the same. Okay. And we're also going to assert equal that test content and p dot content are the same. Very simple test. All this is doing is it's creating an object and then it's making sure that the properties match. And you may think, well, this is 
idiotic. I, I write init tests all the time. And again, this is so that this test will fail when you change the init method. When you change the init method, the test will fail and you'll be reminded that you have to check other parts of your system as well to make sure that nothing has broken. Similarly, if any other tests depend on the post and you're testing uh, them, as soon as your post changes, those tests will also fail and you'll be made aware of that. So let's run this test. In some instances, you can just right click on the post test and run the unit test. This depends on your project structure. If you follow the project structure exactly what I've done here, you have a project folder and in it you have some tests and then you've got unit tests and then post test. So it's a very simple um, structure here. And then you should be able to just right click on the post test class and run the unit tests. As you can see, the test has passed. Um, on that note, if you have a complex project where you have, for example, multiple what I'd call projects in one. Um, um, for example, you have a folder that you've opened with PyCharm and inside it you've got multiple projects and your imports can be sort of messed up. It may not work quite as well. So I'd always recommend you keeping each PyCharm project as simple as possible to make it easy on PyCharm to determine what it's running and, and how things are working. With that said, we are now able to run our tests and I'll just show you what happens uh, if we make the test fail. This is what happens. We see a test failure. And down here it tells us that there's an assertion error because test X is not equal to test. And then it gives us here a, a bit of the difference. Test X is lost a character. The, the expected result is test and so on. Okay. So we've written our first test. How does that feel? To me, writing these tests feels like um like saving for saving money for retirement you know this is security it is making sure that as your system changes you have a, a little something reminding you of the things that you've done in the past and also the tests are the source of truth of how your system should work what this test is saying is when you create a post the title and the content should be equal to what you defined up top. If you have somebody else in your team that comes along and maybe makes a mistake and says, hey, you know, I think the title of the post should always be uh, Rolf. And then you run your tests, it's going to fail. Even though this test is, seems completely correct, it's going to fail because the implementation of the thing that you're testing is wrong. It has a mistake. So then presumably you would catch this at some point and you would say, hey, what have you done here? And you'd revert it and then um, everything would be okay. So that's the purpose of tests. It is primarily to catch any mistakes that arise after the fact. And tests can also be helpful to sort of design the system in a way that is simple. Uh, if writing a test is very hard, um, that may mean that the thing you're testing is too complex. So it also gives you a bit of insight and, and it helps you make decisions as to whether the things that you're doing uh, are right or not. We're going to explore this concept much more throughout the course. So I'll leave it here. I think you guys are getting bored, but this is just a bit of insight into why we test. And we've written our first test, so let's continue and write some more. I'll see you in the next video. Hi and welcome back. In this video we're going to be writing our first set of unit tests. We're going to start by writing unit tests for our models just because those are going to be a bit simpler, a bit easier to write than the resource tests. So let's begin by going into our tests package and creating a new Python package there which I'm going to call unit and in there we're going to create a new Python package which we're going to call models and in there, we're going to create a new Python file, which is going to be test item. Okay, so now we have here our test case uh, file, and we can begin by doing uh, the usual importing test case and from models item import item model. 
we're going to be testing the item model in this test, so we'll have to import that, of course. Now, you know how to begin creating the unit test. We have to create a class that inherits from test case, and we have to create our test methods. I'd encourage you to give it a go. Create the test methods that you think we'll need, and make sure that the test methods you create are unit tests. Okay, so hopefully you uh, were okay doing that. Whenever I, I do this sort of uh, ask a question, I'd recommend you pause the video and code, and then come back to the video, and I'll write the code uh, here. And the way I'd go about it is uh, something like this, create our class, and then create our, our test methods. Now, what do we have in our item model that we have to test? Well, our item model, as you can see, has a few things here that are related to SQL Alchemy. We're not going to be able to test them. We could potentially test that these attributes exist, um, but we have to trust that Python works. So we don't have to test that these attributes are indeed part of the class. We have an init method. We may want to test that out. We have a JSON method there that returns a dictionary, and we may want to test that too as unit tests. The rest of these we cannot test using only unit tests because they depend on the database. So we, we'd have two options. In one option, we could mock the database. That would be not too trivial, so it would be a bit more complicated. And the other option is to not write these tests as unit tests and instead write them as integration tests. That would be the other option. So let's go back into the test, and we're going to uh, write two tests, one for the init method and one for the JSON method. So we're going to have test create item and test item JSON. Okay. Once again, if you've not given this a go, I'd recommend you pause the video now and give a go at how you might write these two unit tests. But I would go and create a sample item. And as we can see, the item has a name and a price that we have to pass in. So we can pass in the name and the price. And then all we have to do is assert that these two properties are, uh, are correct. So we can assert equal that the item name is equal to test. We can assert that the item price is equal to 1999. Now this is some people would say that you don't have to test this because your init method is, is a very simple method. But it's important to have a test that creates a model and sort of makes sure that things are correct. Because if you then go and change your init method, and for example, you change one of the properties in there, one of the property names, for example, instead of price, you rename it to cost then you may see some errors uh, elsewhere in your program. So it's always interesting to have this there um, to remind you of what things should be like. Now, we could run this method, but there's also a third argument that I wanted to make you aware of uh, in the assert methods of the test case, which is that you can pass in a third argument here, uh, that is the error message that will be raised if these two things are not equal. So if these two things are not equal, you're going to get an error message that's quite generic. But you can write your own custom error message at the end as a third argument if you want. And then you can get a bit more information or a bit nicer error message if this does fail. So for example, name of the item. You could write something like that, and you could, of course, have it on a new line there. Okay, and similarly, you could have something like that in here. And the price of the item after creation. There we go. So now if these two fail, you'll get a nice error message, and we can verify that by just running this test. You can see that it passes. If we uh, change one of those things, we should get an error message that says test is not equal to 
pet and it says the name of the item after creation does not equal the constructor argument. You can see here that test is not equal to test and that is the problem. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and test the item JSON. We've got our item, which is going to be an item model. And we've got our expected output for the thing we're going to test. And the expected output is a dictionary of name and price. And then all we have to do is assert equal for item JSON and expected. And then we can say the JSON export of the item is incorrect. Received that and expected that format item.json expected perfect you can potentially even have something like this there now this font is really big so it's spanning it's spanning a lot of my screen there and i have to scroll but this is because this font is size 24 or something like that for recording uh, as you program yourself, you'll have a more reasonable font size and this will be totally fine. These error messages are not excessively long by any means. Okay, so once again, we can run this test method there and we should see that it passes. And all that we've done is done a very common pattern when testing is we've created our um, testable things. That is the item model that we're testing and the expected output of our tests and then we just compared them, and then we've given a nice error message there at the end. This is really common, and you should generally make sure that each test is only testing one thing. In this case, our test has two assertions, but they're both testing whether the item was created correctly. And in here, we don't have to test that the item model properties are set correctly, because those are tested in this other method. So we can jump straight through to testing the method that we do want to test. So that's everything for this video. We've created our two unit tests. Now in the next video, we're going to create some integration tests. So I'll see you there.